German blood. That same blood that we have seen in great Americans. For what makes an American is not any special precious sort of blood, but the tradition we have inherited. It's tradition, not blood, that patterns the way we think and act and feel. Our ancestors came here to escape tyranny. That's part of the American tradition. That's why no American can believe in any government that is not of the people, by the people, and for the people. They came to be able to pray in any way they wanted, or in any church they wanted. That's why freedom of religion is part of our tradition. In school, we learned that none of us is any better than any other American, or anybody else in the world for that matter. But there is no privileged few that all men have equal rights. That's the tradition we were brought up in. At home, at school, among our friends, at our jobs. That is the tradition that has made us what we are. Now, what is the tradition that has made this man? How does it differ from ours? That's what we have to find out. These Germans were selected by Nazi cameras as ideal German types. Let's call one of them Carl Schmidt, a self-termed member of the master race who goose-stepped his way across an entire continent. His father did the same goose-step and followed the same road of conquest. And the grandfather of Carl Schmidt did the same goose-step and trod the same path of aggression. The same goose-step, the same will of aggression, the same lust for conquest. You knew their leader as Hitler. Your father knew the leader as the Kaiser. Your grandfather remembers Bismarck. You faced the Nazi menace. Your father's generation was threatened by the Huns. In your grandfather's day, there were the Prussians. The Nazis, the Huns, the Prussians. Three different names for three generations of Germans, attempting to inflict their will upon others by force. Three generations following a tradition so different from ours. Let's go back even further and see how this tradition began. 150 years ago, there was no single country called Germany. Instead, a loose conglomeration of 300 little states without a common history, religion, or literature. In America, even at that time, we were living under the democratic constitution we enjoy today. The British could look back on hundreds of years of parliamentary government the French had made their revolution in the name of liberty, equality, fraternity. But the 300 little German states were still the property of autocratic princes and ruled without the consent of their peoples. Not one had a constitution, not one had a parliament, not one had freedom of speech or of the press or of assembly. Instead, a rigidly organized medieval society with all power centralized in the hands of the feudal lords. The prime example of this was Prussia, the most aggressive of the German states, where the Junkers, the military caste of landowners, ruled their peasants with iron discipline. To perpetuate this feudal militaristic society, the Prussian king, Frederick the Great, established a rigid code of laws administered by a host of state officials answerable only to him. This was the perfect system to prevent any rise of liberty among his subjects. It was also the perfect system to make possible ruthless aggression against the world. I begin by taking. I shall find scholars afterward to demonstrate my perfect right. And he took. First, he invaded Prussia's brother country, Austria, without a declaration of war. Seven years he fought single-handed against Austria, Russia, Sweden, and France. Thus creating throughout the other German states the myth that Prussian arms were invincible. 
In 1786, Frederick died, but Frederick's state and Frederick's dream of conquest lived on, nurtured and developed by the Prussian militarists, who regarded each war as only one campaign in an unending war for Prussian supremacy in Europe. To this end, Scharnhorst, the organizer, and Gneisenau, the strategist, established the Prussian general staff. Von Clausewitz, the theorist, set down their gospel in his famous book, Von Krieger, on war. Just as Prussia has been fated to be the core of Germany, so Germany will be the core of the future German Empire of the West. Clausewitz's book became the Bible of the Prussian militarists. Conquered people shall be left with nothing but their eyes to weep with. But even as the militarists were plotting, a wave of liberalism swept over Europe. Its eddies reached even Prussia. And ordinary men began to think for themselves and to demand what had long been accepted in America, England, and France, a constitution. The king of Prussia answered, never must a scrap of paper come between me and my subjects. A constitution, a scrap of paper. Some citizens determined on liberty went to the barricades. The machinery of the Prussian state went into action. The revolt died. The will to liberty was not strong enough within the people to defy the voice of authority. One result of which, men with a love of liberty began to leave Prussia and the other German states. In the next 30 years, two million of them came to find freedom in the United States alone. While their cousins, remaining behind, were molded into ruthless automatons, ready to follow blindly the will of a leader. And that leader arose. Otto von Bismarck, appointed Prime Minister of Prussia in 1862. A clever man, a shrewd man, but devoted to the Prussian dream of conquest and a master of the Prussian method of achieving it. The great questions of the day will not be decided by resolutions of majorities, but by blood and iron, and to go with it, ruthless discipline at home. As soon as anybody can show me that it is sound policy, I shall be equally satisfied to see our troops fire at the French, the Russians, the English, or the Austrians. Two years after Bismarck became prime minister, he provoked a...